Hi, Pippa. Hello. This is so exciting. Good to talk it's to fun you. fun to chat with you. So we've been here with the collective for a few days now, talking about some amazing topics and, pro and, and subjects and meeting people who have been doing incredible things um, in the name of advancing humanity uh, generally. But we've been also speaking about some specific things as well, and we've been trying to understand their relationships with uh, the broader systems around us. And as we've mentioned before, we live in a world of systems mm. and there's a lot going on. And I think one thing that I'd love to hear about from you uh, in our conversation is how we understand the different layers of our systems, whether they are on the surface, below the surface, above or into space. And just going to get your thoughts on how are you seeing all of this right now in terms of where your interests are lying and then specifically what you're picking up. Okay. And to be clear, you are quite the expert in a actually wide range of this issue of what is our reality. And I want to talk to you about artificial intelligence and where we're going with that and its application to, I know you're very well known, particularly for your work in transportation, but that's really about the bigger issue of how humanity builds, lives, creates. So we'll, we'll get into that. And I don't know if you can talk about who you work with or not. So, yeah, can, I will, yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, now or? Well, yeah, just so we'll they know, you know. Yeah, so uh, I have worked in um, the world of uh, the future of living and working, basically. That's the best way to describe it. So anything that, anything that moves people, connects people to work, to life, to social things to anything that basically connects us to the moments of our lives. And I've worked in the public sector and in the private sector and in the technology sector uh, for about 20 years now. And it's one of those passion things where as a kid, I just knew this was what I was going to do. I didn't know what it was called, but I knew I was going to do this. I always used to draw cities from the future as a child. Like the second I got dexterity in my hand, I was drawing skyscrapers, networks, even transport networks, intergalactic networks with portals and schedules and times and prices in different <laughs> currencies and wow. things. So, and my parents were like, we don't know what this is, but you need encyclopedias. So they gave me encyclopedias so and I, I read it from, I was social, but kind of awkward when I was a kid. And so I could, I could hear and see different things. And so, but I'd spend every day reading the encyclopedia from page A1 to the end of Z, right? Me too, I love and then that. Go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and then I'd add extra pages. I'd actually add, and so saying, well, that's actually okay, but what about, let's add some more information to that. <laughs> and so I kept on adding all these things, and I'd, my parents would give me, every kid uh, my age, um, when I was 12, 13, would get like toy trucks or cars, etc. I would get maps. Oh, my, that's and I'd get so the, cool. I'd get the Thomas Brothers or the Rand McNally, oh, and I, I would start that. doing extensions in cities. And then say, OK, this needs a new subway line, this needs this, etc. Mm -hmm. Add all these different things. And then I'd actually start doing 3D versions of like high level and then start really integrating things. And I think it was because I was allowed as a kid to ride my bicycle everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so when my parents thought of me riding in the neighborhood, I was actually riding my bike to the nearest train, going into downtown in Melbourne riding around downtown as a 13 year old when probably shouldn't have been going to sketchy neighborhoods and sketchy areas and going to dis, uh, dismantled uh, warehouse wow. facilities and imagining what it would look like to rebuild it all wow. right wow and those channeling things from above and everything else which we'll get into later but all this is say i got into architecture school because everyone said that's an architect and I got into architecture school and it was so boring. Mm -hmm. It was all about the building and the ego. And I was like, this is just not me at all. And I remember asking, well, how do people get to the building? Like, what's, how, what connects the building? What about the networks underneath? And they're like, that's regional and urban systems. I'm like, what's that? And they said, that's the other department there, but they don't have much money and their building's pretty ugly. So go over there. And I, I went there. <laughs> I sat with them all and we were talking about systems and interconnectivity and layers and all these different things. And they were using the latest technology because they were the ones that had access to like, you know, Esri and the different like uh, cadastral files on, on GIS. And I just went like, oh, these are my people, right? So found it and said, quickly, I'm exiting architecture, I'm not interested and got into this and um, haven't looked back. And I think the first jobs that I could get were either working with telecommunication systems, where I could actually like plan and map out the cellular systems, the cell networks. That led to understanding zoning, mm -hmm. which led me to transport because I was bigger networks. And I kind of was also a little lazy. It's like, 
Well, which job can I do that gives you the most money with the least amount of effort, right? So Smart, <laughs> yeah. okay. Some will call it optimizing himself, yeah. but um, it always ended up being like these regional government agencies that were doing future technology stuff that would actually employ people like me to like systematize things and operationalize stuff. Oh, one caveat that I'm, while I'm a big visionary and a big dreamer and stuff, I cannot just do that. I have to actually see stuff built mm. in the ground. Mm. So I'm a very operational person. So these are like these perfect utility companies or transport agencies or economic development agencies. These are the perfect places where you could dream big and actually implement. At that time, Google X didn't exist. Mm. So this was where I could get an Excel and Excel and Excel and then got to the level at the federal government level in, in the US and uh, working with governments overseas. And we had this smart city challenge that we're creating a brand new smart city uh, layer for San Francisco. I was the chief innovation officer for San Francisco at the time for transport. And we created this brand new layer. We had this concept called shared electric connected and automated, which is like the four mega trends for, for um, AI based mobility. And then I got this tap from Google saying, we like that. You need to come and work with us. And so I had um, 11 interviews um, at Google X for a department that didn't exist, uh, for a company that didn't exist, uh, in a location that didn't exist, uh, phone scrambled, all that sort of stuff, but nothing, nothing would work. And they're like, look, we're not going to promise you anything, but you have the googliness, because everyone gets ranked on their googliness, right? You have the googliness and you, you do meet our profiles, but you may or may not meet one of the founders, and they may or may not spend more than 30 seconds with you, and that may result that you may or may not work here. It's not sure. <laughs> well, I was like, okay, fair okay. enough. <laughs> um, did that, so I sat there up for the 11th interview. By the way, this is like the most high-tech facility in the world, sure. and the aircon broke down. <laughs> then the cameras broke down. Then the video conferencing broke down. Then the microphones broke down. Then it got too hot. Then it got too cold. And I was like, okay, I'm being tested. Like, you know, can I handle all this stuff? And I was like, <laughs> am I a prima donna? Am I going to get all upset? Like, you know, do you know who I am kind of people? None of that happened. This guy walks past, door opens, because these doors are automatic, the door opens, wearing a you know, sweaty Lululemon on top with Crocs and looking at his phone, and he's like, are you Tim? I said, yeah, and he goes, hi, I'm Sergey." And I was like, oh, okay, the Sergey." And then started talking and chatting away, and I can't tell what he talked about, but he talked about something that said, you know, what's the best city in the world? And I said to him, there isn't one. And he said, why? It's because of all these problems. You know? And he goes, well, why haven't you worked on fixing them? I said, I have. I've been making San Francisco as best as I can. And I said, well, why are you working on one city? Why don't you work on all 5,000? Mm. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? And he goes, I have a place you can do that. So okay. um, what was supposed to be a 30-second conversation was one and a half hours. Um, took a whole bunch of other stuff. And I left and got a ping. And I said, what is it that you need to start tomorrow? Wow. <laughs> And wow. And that was five years ago and worked on a bunch of different things, um, which we could talk about. But one of the, the best, most exciting thing I think that I can talk about was we worked on developing the world's first autonomous self-driving car technology, which basically allowed anything with wheels to move from A to B using, at that time and still today, the world's most advanced AI, mm -hmm. which was a series of predictive AI and uh, different kind of uh, AI layers that are all in based in the vehicle. So it doesn't rely on satellite or outside communication. All decisions were made on board the vehicle. And why that was really interesting was because it was AI personified in a real life form, which was the hardest of the hardest to do because AI in software is one thing, AI in a room is another thing, but to move AI mm. in time and space around us meant that we could do things like satellites and drones and everything else that has basically leapt frog from that, that technology. So yeah, that was the, the journey. And since then I've been advising on my own um, other companies, which we can, we can touch upon, yeah. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot more, but yeah. I was so glad you gave that yeah. background. Yeah. So yeah, you asked me kind of what I'm focused on. And so as an economist, I'm always trying to figure out where are there new sectors? Um, what's the flow of the world economy look like? How will geopolitics either foster or inhibit um, good outcomes. And so I tend to look at things very holistically, uh, which is very unusual for economists. They love to get very narrow, oh, yeah. um, you know. <laughs> Especially um, microeconomists, urban economists. Here you like go, economists. very narrow, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and so one of the areas I realized that is just profoundly changing our world is space. Yeah. I, I hadn't clocked it, but, but I got onto it and I realized this is so big that 
we're literally at a once in a species moment. We're not going back to the moon to step on it. We're going back to stay. Yeah. We're going back to build and we're going back to build launch pads from it. Right. And if you sit with the you know, people who are at the front line of this, that's all they're doing right. all day long. Right. Um, and I guess because when the Challenger shuttle blew up mm -hmm. and we lost Sally Ride, the first female astronaut, it was a massive deal for the United States because she was a school teacher and right. every school child in the country was watching. Right. And it ended in this horrible explosion, this incredible failure of the American dream right. and, that, and of technology failed right. in, right. A, in that crucial moment. And Congress said to NASA, no more money for you. Yeah. You cannot be killing school teachers right. on national television. Right. And then that was the beginning of the money started to go over to Elon. Right. And so the whole privatization of the space sector was a function of that event. Now the private sector was able to do this faster, better as they always do. And so now we've conquered lift. So basically getting things from earth into space we're good. We know how to do this. This right. is not hard anymore. Now the issue is once you're in space, how do we build? And then how do we pull, retrieve from space back to Earth? So this is a whole new level of development. Plus the telecoms infrastructure is the centerpiece of this. And even today, I think people don't understand. There's a Google spinoff right. called Alria, right. which has already created the first interplanetary internet. Right. And there's a company called Lynx, which is just a little startup. Right. But they have already turned the mobile phone we all have in our pockets into a satellite phone. And then people say, well, so I could talk to an astronaut in space. Yes. They're like, but I don't know any of them, so there's no conversation <laughs> right. I want to have with them. And I'm like, you don't get it. What is coming is, and as of actually two weeks ago, what's been launched is the first factory right. in space, right. in orbit. Right. And then people are like, what do you mean factory? Well, we're going to be making things in space. So think of it as we used to, we used to build something here on Earth, like let's say the James Webb telescope, and then we'd lift it into space. Which is really hard. Which is super hard. Expensive. Like, ugh, really hard. Missions wise, everything else, right? Yeah. Now we can lift and build it in right. space. Right whether on the moon or in orbit or beyond. And so this construction process is all about robotics, automation, and AI. So I envisage now a world economy where many people are sitting with a laptop and what they're doing is running a factory that's in orbit or in space. And people are like, whoa, wait, yeah. what? But I see a massive economy building there. And it's things like, just to be clear, because people are like, what are you going to make in space? The first factory that's gone up is making drugs. Yep. It's like, what? Drugs. But it turns out that certain ingredients won't meld together no in a gravity environment, no, but right. they will in a no gravity right. environment. Also, there's no FDA. And so experimentation, exploration has no boundary once you're out of Earth's jurisdiction. That's a different issue, but interesting. But also things like fiber optic cables which are the key to connectivity on Earth currently. And the speed of the transmission of the data is affected by how many bubbles are right. in the fiber optics. Right. And in gravity, you got lots of bubbles. In zero gravity, no, no bubbles. bubbles. No. So if you make it up there, and they don't weigh very much, so bringing them back is not hard. Um, so I saw this explosion of this, and the main things are space-based solar power, which now Caltech has proven works. works yeah. And Airbus has proven works. And the Saudis have backed the British deal. And we're going to see a whole lot of private sector innovation here. And that's not 20 years now. No. That's five. Right. Within five years, we're going to have commercial enterprises that allow you to have virtually unlimited electricity anytime, anywhere that's cheap and green, clean. It's a game changer. Totally game and changer. it means you don't need to use hydrocarbons in the way we've had to. And the second one is, it sounds so sci-fi, but it isn't. It's asteroid mining. Oh, yeah. And that's this ability to get everything we need for fighter jet, MRI scanner, iPhone, cobalt, lithium, silicon, but in higher quality, mined from asteroids in space, and then bring back the refined material. 
So now you don't have to rip earth up anymore for these things. So both of those things, in my opinion, are so radically going to change the landscape of geopolitics. And so just to finish, so I'm doing a documentary on this now. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, and because what I see is this knife edge. On the one hand, we're reaching for abundance and we are going to get it. But whoever gets there first is so far ahead of everybody else because to have unlimited energy and unlimited resources is an extraordinary position to be in. Because it gives you unlimited power. Unlimited power. Right. And then will that trigger war, particularly since war has already kind of begun in space? And that knife edge, the public doesn't even know we're in space, yeah, yeah. let alone this knife edge we have to navigate. But you know, we've always been on a knife edge, mm. right? This is a thing that's really difficult for people to understand is that the world that we've lived in has always been on a knife's edge. We're always at that point of at the absolute last second, do we or do we not make a decision? I mean, generally, I think we've never really not made the, the, the right decision. I think the thing that's been really challenging from a systems perspective is that nothing we do as humans is linear. <laughs> Everything is exponential. So two minutes before this, I made a let's just say I made a very big decision that saved humanity. But it wouldn't have been three months ago in a linear fashion up until two minutes ago. There'd be almost no correlation to three months ago to two minutes ago. Mm. And I think that's the same thing with climate action, the same thing with like, you know, all of the different things we're doing with like energy efficiency, even the way that we grow our foods, all the different things that are happening, I call those these big S-curves, right? And so we, we're going through these, these massive S-curve changes and I think we just mentioned before, which was really interesting, a century ago, the convergence of four S-curves, which was telephony, the elevator, mm. mass production, and electricity. Those four things created the world that we have around us. And it changed more in the last 60 years than it did in the previous 500. We're now going through a dozen of these S-curves yes. simultaneously, yes. right? Whether it's, whether it's uh, AI, blockchain, crypto, data, 3D printing, robotics, I mean, I can go on and on because this is the world that I, that I work on, but it's, it's, it's a sphere now rather than this exponential curve. It's actually a sphere of interlocking mm. systems. And one press here sends these all off and they splinter and they create these fantastic little side things. Now AI is linking with blockchain to create new splinters and then 3D printing and DNA sequencing is splintering up to something else. So these are now knife edges on knife edges, right? And at a certain point, I think we just become uh, numb to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to these edges because to, uh, to your point, should a power come forward, they'll only come forward, I believe, for a moment until the others come forward in, in the other parts as well. And so what I'm hoping is that this will force collaboration yes. in ways that we've never had before. Yes, I agree with that. That cross even political lines or even cultural lines in ways that we understand basic universal principles. And I know I sound like a Trekkie when I say this sort of stuff, but <laughs> we will get to a point where the economy and the, and the way that spending money will become less relevant. If we can actually biomimic things, if we can replicate things, and a few projects that I'm working on where they're developing these replicant type tools that went, once sent into space, you know, the thing about carbon capture and storage is that they're doing it all in the wrong way. They want to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, which is really hard and expensive, and then shoot it into the ground, which is really hard and expensive, versus having the factory in space, orbiting, pulling the carbon from space and creating products out of the carbon. Because mm. once you densify carbon, you now have a building material that's abundant because yes. we have a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, yes. right? So there's a whole different way of looking at this and using space, not as the final frontier, but as our next door step into yeah. our elevated human species. My question to you is, because you're so close to the geopolitics part of it, you're also close to the space part of it, and there's an in-between space, which is this outside space that's watching us, that's learning about us, that we don't like to talk about because it makes us uncomfortable. We talked before about if you question vaccines being tested, you're also considered a wackadoodle of you know, anti-vaxxer. But there's been so many things happening around us in the last hundred years, in the last two years, in the last two months that say that there must be something more than just us. Yes. And you've been writing about it in a very cautious way because you are an economist and you are this, you know, <laughs> person of, of, you know, revere in, in all these different, like, you know, logical spaces. But I think this is logical. I think it's a rational, logical discussion we need to have about if there are other 
entities out there, if our energy, energy forces out there, we know we can only see 5% of the matter around us. We know that's been proven. We have metrics now and sensors that can pick up all the other matter around us as well. There is more out there. We don't just see this color spectrum. We can see far beyond it. So why is there such reticence from it? Why, why is there such fear to talk about it? Okay, so there are like two layers to this. And Only two, right? <laughs> two <laughs> I'm going to start with. So one is the way is the reticence, and two is what's happening. Right. Um, and so just quickly, the, the reticence, I guess... One of the things I find really strange is that the, one of the most important things that makes the economy go and makes culture go, makes humanity progress, is change. Right. And yet, when you suggest that things have to change, everyone's like, oh, uh, no, 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 I don't want to change. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and in the world economy, people are very upset when jobs have to change, as if we live in a world where you have one job and you should be entitled to it for your whole life. And I'm like, who wants to work that way anyway? What a boring life. Don't mm -hmm. you want to have different things you do right. in the course of your life? But, right. And we haven't even had that since the 1950s. Right. So why is everyone nostalgic for something that right. doesn't exist? But I'm, I'm amazed at this reluctance to change. And I noticed it even in myself. Um, and I like, you know me, I like to do some cliff diving yes. with, you know, taking risks and chances with things and... Metaphorically, not literally. Metaphorically, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, career changes and stuff. But I noticed in the lockdown during COVID, I lived near the canals in yeah. London. I could walk to the yeah. canal. And I was able to do, go for very long walks during COVID. I, I joined you on one of those. Yes. yes. And I realized, I had, didn't even realize that the canal was near me. I'd never been on it, and it changed my understanding of London. It changed my understanding of my geography, mm. my physical space. And I'm like, what if I changed the way I went to meetings? I took a different path, not the one I usually take. And I was, oh, that's it. there's a cool restaurant, and there's a cool bar, and there's a great park. And, and I realized I was training my brain to be more comfortable with change. Yep. And that's something that needs to happen. So that's, this is very profound on this issue that we're now going to get into. Right. And to be clear, I wrote my first piece on this very tricky subject about almost exactly a year ago. Yeah. And I really hesitated. I did a lot of homework before I hit the send button on that article, which was the third piece of, a, of an article I wrote on the space space. Right. So it was called the space space. Um, anomalous phenomena. Right. So this is what I've learned from really studying this. And I, there's a long history on this, and we can pull a lot of the threads out, but the ones that matter in my understanding is somewhere around 2007. There was a Navy pilot called Ryan Graves, who I've now met. He's a very brilliant man. He was one of the top F-18 pilots in the U.S. Navy, but more importantly, a Top Gun instructor. Right. So he's our top level. Well, Ryan Graves and his co-pilots were seeing off of Catalina Island in California and off of Virginia Beach, where they were doing training missions all the time. They were seeing things that were absolutely unidentified aerial phenomena, as the phenomena is now called. It used to be called UFOs. UFOs yeah. Now they've changed it because they're trying to destigmatize it. And so now they're called uh, UAPs. So instead of going to the bosses and saying, I'm seeing these things, which would have immediately resulted in his pilot's license being yanked for right. losing his marbles, he was so clever. He said, look, we've got all kinds of equipment. Let's triangulate on this thing. So they applied the floor cameras, our most sophisticated cameras, um, infrared, radar, and then multiple sets of senior pilots' eyes. And then all the data came back that it's there and it is moving in these strange ways that defies everything we know about physics. So now nobody can say it's your imagination. Right, right, right. Okay, so he nailed that, right? Then he's like, okay, so how do I take this to the Pentagon? Because if we say we've got crazy UFOs, then they'll just fire all of us. Right. Uh, right? Just ignore the data, right? So he's so smart. He went, this is a health and safety issue for the pilots. These things are getting this close to us, and some one of our guys is going to get killed. 
they can't ignore that, right? We're in a health and safety culture. Right. So suddenly they had to begin addressing it. And this led to five years of private hearings in Congress. It led to the release of what they call the Tic Tac videos, right. uh, which were officially taken by Navy pilots and then declassified so that they could be put in the public domain. To be clear, by the way, a lot of this data is collected on systems that are themselves classified. Right, right. So what the US doesn't want to do is reveal to opponents what how, we have, where. Right. Yeah, so it's not about the phenomena, it's about our system. Right. Anyway, so the Tic Tac video got released 2017, the New York Times reports it, private hearings begin, and then and then public hearings for the first time in 50 years. Then Congress says, we're changing the legislation and we're gonna protect all the whistleblowers. We're basically gonna say everyone in the US government, the Office, of National the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Pentagon, like every part of government, you have to tell us what you've got what you've on got, this right, subject. Right. And we're gonna protect the whistleblowers. Next thing you know, whistleblowers start coming forward, boom. So this is this guy, David Grush. Now David Grush is one of our most senior intelligence officers. He's a young 36 year old, um, Office of Geospatial Intelligence, uh, National Reconnaissance Office, and seconded to the program at the Pentagon that's all about this subject. Right. And so he's gone forward, not as a whistleblower against the Pentagon, but with the permission and support of the Pentagon and of Congress. So he said, look, this is, I know all about all these special access programs, which are the secret black budget programs, where a lot of this stuff seems to have been embedded. And there's stuff going on that um, needs to be made public. Now, in a way, what's happening is they're testing the response of the public. Right. It's not that they're testing Grush, and it's not his job to prove it. Now it's the people he's accusing, it's their job. So actually, as of last week, um, Congress has passed a further amendment, which says, if in six months you haven't handed over what you have, we will prosecute you. So now everybody's like, uh, you can't hide anymore. You're gonna have to go public. So then the question is, what is it? Oh, no. So here's the thing I've come away with, with all these different discussions. I don't even know, it's because I'm curious. So I go start talking to people and <laughs> they used to work in the White House. They're like, oh, okay, we'll talk to you. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm always about protecting, look, I want to get into the subject rather than so-and-so said. Yeah, not the, right? so, you don't care what the skeletons are. I don't, you yeah, I'm not, I just want the data. <laughs> exactly. So what, what seems to be happening is there's a lot of discussion about interdimensionality. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wait, what does that mean? And we can prove that at least 11 dimensions exist mathematically. Right. Right. Some would argue 17, some say 19. But what's clear is we know as a, a mathematical phenomena this exists. There's a, you'll find these officials are not using the language of aliens so much. They're using the language of interdimensionality. Right. You heard David Grush say, the phenomena is not coming from some faraway place. It's co-located with humanity and always has been. Right. And you're like, okay, the way we're conceiving of what it is is wrong because the movies have all said it's coming from space. Right. Now, is it that there's knowledge from our being in space about the phenomena, I think we're gonna see the answer is definitely yes. But is it a space-based phenomena? No. So then the question is why now? And maybe I'll finish with that and we go deeper into the subject because yeah. that's the question everybody asks, yeah. why now? And the answer is partly, we, the military and the intelligence agencies used to have a monopoly on all the data from space. That's been broken by all these private satellites, private cameras, and private sensors that are now up there. Again, that's the Starlink and da-da-da. Right. Um, it's also that the quality of our sensors has improved so dramatically, and as you know, the quality of supercomputing, right, our right, capacity right. to problem solve, right. vastly accelerated. So suddenly you can make sense of stuff that in the past you couldn't. Right. I think it's the internet and humans who've had experiences are able to connect 
find each other, right. compare notes. Although within this community of experts on the subject, and I'll just finish with this, we're still constrained by our Cartesian approach to life. Absolutely. So when Rene Descartes basically separated the mind from the body and said, the only science counts and anything that's mystical or imaginary, that belongs to the church. They can handle that. But we're only going to deal with this reality now. And I remember Arthur Kessler, the philosopher uh, who used to hang around with Hemingway, wrote, "This is he called it the Cartesian catastrophe. Yes. But the thing is, we did learn a lot from pure science, right. test, right. dissect, right. what works, doesn't work, and using the scientific method. But at the expense of anything that didn't fit, everything else got sent into that crazy bucket. But we know for sure there are many things where you can't measure it, but it's real. Love is a good example, which is probably the primary thing driving humanity. And so you can't say it doesn't matter, right? right. It's at the core of what it is to be a human, but how do you measure it? Yeah, good luck with that. Right. So now this subject, we're starting to reintegrate. What are the facts? So these Navy pilots, they're all focused on you know, what is its shape and when does it show up and what is the speed it's going at and how close to my plane is it versus what you'll find if you talk to many of these people, they'll also say, but I've had experiences. I've, I've had downloads. I suddenly know things I don't know how I know them. So getting them together to discuss not just the science, but this other mystical, numinous, um, non-quantifiable piece is also part of the story. So I think what we're going to find is new physics are coming in the next few years. The breaking of the traditional Einstein traditional model, because it served us well, but we're able to expand Stand it now. now yeah. And second, that um, the definition of reality itself is going to be changing. And that's an ontological shock for a lot of people. But life, we already know, we can grow plants in moon dust. Right. We already see NASA telling us all the time that the component parts for DNA are on asteroids and meteors. Right. So they're kind of hinting to all of us, life exists beyond Earth and in lots of different formats. And always has. And always has. And probably always will. And I think what's interesting is the, um, it's a very Western, it's again, it's that Columbusing, you know, when I've, I've <laughs> discovered this, right? It's I've a verb now. It. It's like the, the, just Columbus and the native uh, cultures, which I've worked with for over two decades, have songs that there are songs in Indigenous Australian, um, Indigenous Aboriginal Torres Strait Island people, one of the tribes that I'm very close with, they have a constellation song. Mm -hmm. And their song is maybe 50,000 years old maybe 60,000 years old, but it's a song where they basically sing the constellation and then they have a um, uh, Western um, astronomers who've basically caught, put all the coordinates and they match exactly, right? So we have known this for a long time. We have went through this great forgetting during the ice ages. There's a lot of theories about that why we forgot certain things, why we remembered certain things and now all of a sudden things keep reappearing that a lot of people have basically said, I didn't know that I knew this, but it just felt like I just knew this stuff. Like I woke up one day and I just remembered these things that I just didn't know why. And now, now, now that I know this stuff, I can move forward. So I'm very curious to see like, what does it actually do overall for humanity as well? Because this straitjacket that we've been in, this, this you know, Western capital straitjacket of everything is this way or that way, and, and it's very didactic, very, very linear, is now being questioned and unwrapped but I wonder how much of us will ricochet as we open this up, mm. you know, and that's, that's going to be a question of in a world that is seeming so scarce and tight and so tightly bound, can it afford that? Does it have the slack mm. for this kind of shift to happen while keeping relative peace 
at the same time, I think we're always at that interesting intersection. Another knife edge, Another knife as edge. you describe. Right. So again, Senator Gillibrand uh, and Senator Rubio, who are leading the charge on this, which, by the way, is so interesting, is one of the only areas where we see bipartisan totally. cooperation, like totally. 100%. Right. So that tells us something. Um, and so it's Senator, human. It's human. It's human. <laughs> I think deep down, they're both human. Let's hope they're both exactly. human. Exactly. Right. So Senator Gillibrand's position is, let's bring science to this. And because we're in geopolitical conflict, we have the risk of nuclear events, and we've seen a Chinese spy balloon fly over the United States, followed by three other unidentified objects, which we shot down. Mm -hmm. But they apparently had no visible means of propulsion. They don't fit the profile of anything we know. So did we just shoot at whatever this other thing is, is that right. really how we want to open the conversation? Right. right? Is, it, is this how we want to... It's almost like, it's almost like a, a cliche, like this is, they, almost, they already know our, our, <laughs> the way that we operate, so they're just offering us these little soft little things to target us to shoot at, because that's all our reptilian brain can handle. <laughs> and it's like, okay, we know how this story goes. We're now going to decloak everything and really show what's going on. So, so just settle down, little people. So, so Senator yeah. Gillibrand basically said after that whole incident, she's like, you know what? You guys keep saying you don't know what it is at the Pentagon. Uh, that's not acceptable anymore. Yeah. We need to know. Right. We need to know. Is it Chinese? Is it Russian? Is it something else? But don't tell me anymore. We don't know what it is. Is it us? Or is it us? Yeah. If, and maybe it's us. Yeah. We need to know. Right. Because we are now on the brink of conflict among superpowers. We cannot be shooting at stuff we don't understand. So then Senator Rubio came out just a couple days ago and said, in the private hearings that have been held in Congress, we've had a huge amount of testimony about direct contact with whatever this other intelligence is. So then that created a firestorm. Um, so I think, again, it's a drip feed. And there are going to be something between 6 and 10 of these witnesses that are super high level. And they're going to drip feed it out. And the public is, for, for people who are into this subject, they're going to be like, when are you going to show me the evidence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For people who are not in the subject, they're like, wait, What's going what on? are we talking about exactly? And I think it's like a gradual testing of the public. And the answer is, it all depends on us. Right. If we freak out, they're going to slow back. it down. If we can handle it, then we'll get more information. But you're not going to get a sudden boom piece of proof because that risks people having a, what I, again, I know it's an awkward word, but an ontological breakdown, which right. is when your whole understanding of reality is suddenly broken. Right. That is very hard for humans to handle. I mean, like children whose parents get divorced and so like their whole world is turned upside down. Like it's a very traumatic experience for people to experience it. And, and any other trauma that you have, this would be another version of trauma but that would be like on a worldwide level. It's almost religious. You it's know? almost religious. It's like, this did this, what does this question everything? If you question everything, and I'm going to bring it back because we were talking about uh, super intelligence. Let's talk about artificial intelligence next. But it's the same phenomenon of if you think of the last five years, um, in the world that I work on, in, on, on these S curves, in the world of technology, the last five years affected us in terms of behavior change more than the previous hundred, right? Because of all the different things we've done, we've seen change, whether it's social media, whether it's the different algorithmic, mm -hmm. algorithms basically run, run our lives right now. It's making us question a lot of things. The downs, one of the downsides of this questioning is that we went to a point where we stopped believing media at a certain point, and now we've got to the point where we don't believe anything. Yeah. The one thing that if you say, if there's a cynical approach to this side of the algorithmic war against people's view of reality is that they won in that we no longer not just believe the government, we don't believe anybody, we don't believe anything, we don't believe science, we don't believe anything. So this disbelief of everything around us means that we now go tribal and start focusing on our personal narrative. And anything that aligns with our personal narrative is the truth, and anything that's against our personal narrative is false. Not just false, they're stupid. And they're dumb. And stupid I'm, or evil. Stupid or evil yeah. or both, or I'm not going to yeah. talk to them, not interested in so on. And so there's this interesting thing that's happening right now on AI where a new truth is forming. Yeah. And it's a combination of it's my personal narrative, it's a bit of my gut feeling, it's the interwebs, which is kind of supposed to be truth, 
And it's a bunch of people reinforcing that truth by saying, look, this stuff just happened, it's happening, it's just happening right now. So if you think about that from a different perspective, from a systems perspective, this is where I get really excited, is that that's an opportunity to reestablish one's point of reality and one's point of truth mm -hmm. or the set of truths. And it's fodder for a lot of manipulation and, and coercion, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we keep this moving forward? It's evolving. You know, a lot of governments in Europe, for example, are really trying to regulate AI. The US is not even is trying to create these new rules. The UK is positioning itself as it's like middle ground. I'm, I'm writing about how the UK is saying that the UK, by the way, is the first open AI office outside of the US. They were being lobbied heavily by, by France and by ja Japan and a few other countries. And they chose that. But that is a real big push now to like, who is the middle ground? Where is this middle? Where is the safe space for innovation to grow, to fail? to expand, to experiment, while not being regulated and capped and basically contained. And so how are you, how are you thinking about that? Because that's, the, that's I think, another interesting area. What do you think about where AI takes us, given these things? Yeah, I think that's a, there's a very, lots of layers in that, in that question, right? So it's like systems of systems of systems. Mm. So I'll, I'll break it down a little bit. Uh, first, we need to step back and say, what is AI? Yeah. Because AI is so many things to so many people. And a lot of AI is not AI, <laughs> yes, just, just to be clear. True. So a lot of it is smoke and mirrors, a lot of it is yeah. vaporware, a lot of it is what we call tack-on wear. Mm -hmm. It's not real. So I think, the, again, the question of like, what is AI and, and what, is the, what, is the, what, what is it and what isn't? AI is, real AI is basically applied statistics. So it's applying a statistical system of, of, mm. of processes and it's coming out with certain outputs. The challenge we've had in the last couple of years is that we've been using these large language models and even the word language is very human it's we're humanizing ones and zeros basically and these large language models are basically de developing patterns in data and their job is to do three things they develop patterns in data they make um, predictions based on those patterns so first is patterns in data predictions of those patterns and then decisions on those predictions and as it gets stronger and stronger and stronger with more and more interaction it feels more human-like, but it's not human. I think that's where we all get lost. So as humans, we know if we read a book, we've done those tests where they take out every second word, we finish the sentence. Mm. They take out every second letter, we still finish the sentence because our eyes have developed over, over millennia to basically complete the picture of reality. To, to Shannon's point before, what is reality? Our eyes always complete the, the, the picture of reality around us so that we can get to that to find out what the next step is. And most AI is doing four things. You know, when I was, when I was on the team developing the, when we were working on, on creating Waymo from the Google self-driving car project, the four questions had to be fundamentally answered every second. Where am I? What's around me? What's everybody doing? What should I do next? Mm. And the fifth is what's the safe path of travel? But that gets answered every thousandth of a second. Mm. So perception localization, actuation, movement, right? And the same thing happens with this world that we're seeing with ChatGPT and all these, these predictive uh, models is that they're basically using a large language model to basically bring a string of words that sound cogent and sound human-like and it sounds like a conversation, it sounds intelligent, it's not. It's applied statistics. And that's where we are right now with this whole thing. It's applied statistics. And I have to say, I'm really concerned about the doom, doomers and gloomers from the, the media world. This is the, this is the next thing they're glomming onto as it's going to take our jobs. It's going to change our lives. It's going to kill us. It's going to eat us. It's going to do these things to us, except improve our way of life. And the same thing could be said 40 years ago for email and for internet and for everything else like that. And 60 years before that and 100 years before that for cars and electricity. We always have these doom cycles of like, this is going to kill, it's going to end us. And it doesn't. But what it does, it fundamentally changes us. And so the question we have in front of us is, what do we want this to do for us? Mm. And how do we want it actually to manifest? And yeah, it's going to help. It's going to affect things like accounting and, and anything, anything that counts as a job yeah. will be automated. That's, that's given. Now, between now and 10 years time, will be fully automated. Anything that thinks and creates will be replicated. It will not be replaced. It will be replicated, which means that I can now generate quote unquote art. But is it art? I don't know, because we can't measure art. It's one of the things, like you said, mm. we can't measure love. 
we know what's art because we can feel it. It's kind of like the famous saying, you know what mm. pornography is and, and when you see it, but you can't describe it in words. Well, that's a very fine line of subjectivity, which is a very human thing. And so as humans, we have two traits that I think any artificial um, technology and super will not be able to replicate. One is paranoia. <laughs> It's very hard to replicate paranoia because it's irrational, completely insane, right? So it doesn't make sense. And the other is um, basically religion. Mm. You know, this belief in something that is much bigger and much broader and much more powerful that is actually rational, you know? And the idea that we believe in something, like I have cousins, for example, who said to me, like, I asked them, like, why do you do this thing that's based on their religion? Because that's just how I feel. You can't explain it, but you, they just, that's how they feel, and, and I just can't feel that, right? So if we look at that from that perspective, we'll be always able to like gov create governance models that basically check ourselves against that. What we won't be able to do if we're not careful is that as you pointed before, in the space race, in this AI race, if a government backed by a company learns how to create more manipulative algorithmic tools, then we're in a very different world. And I think that's where most people are concerned about. It's not that this super AGI or artificial general intelligence will take care of and basically kill us all. By the way, that's almost impossible to even fathom how that happened. We'll have teleportation before we have this, right? So, and there's a team working on that, but not yet. Um, <laughs> so we can, we can, you know, antimatter, understanding antimatter, we have to figure out how to develop anti, uh, how to develop gravity in space for us to live there. Yeah. So that will come before this, right? What I hope to see happen is, is a situation where we become a bit more real about what a lot of this uh, artificial intelligence actually is. Because a lot of it's just fake. A lot of it's just replicating stuff and just continuing chat body responses. Mm -hmm. But it's not like, for example, I can get AI to give me some information that is mostly uh, true, especially using Google Bard, which is based on the internet. It's, it's more true than, say, ChatGPT, for example. It hallucinates less, doesn't it? Not, it hallucinates less. But it will not answer for me right now a complex question of, here are all my life situations. What should I do next? Mm. Like, I want to live in this, I want to live in a, I want to live in a tax efficient lifestyle with these parameters. Which countries can I move to based on what and how does it optimize for my business? It can't answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask 10 lawyers those questions, you get 10 different answers. Oh, at least. Right? Maybe so, more. <laughs> so that's the challenge with the current system is that it's, it's, pulling from stuff that just doesn't able to, to handle it. And these open AI systems just give you garbage. When you have closed AI systems that are very focused, like for example, on in an industry sector or, or, a, or a relevant sector, it's incredible what they do. There's, there's stuff, stuff that I'm working on now, which is working on replicating and optimizing for development. And the way that it understands the world, the way that it understands climate, the way that it understands building materials and science, and it comes back to and says, this is how you can optimize for a building efficiency. That is unbelievable. So that's where I think is going to be very, very, very different. Maybe last thing, because we've really done such a deep dive here. Um, so I think AI is going to give us an explosion of creativity. Absolutely. I think that it's... Uh, and challenges, by the way. And challenges and challenges. <laughs> it's disintermediating... Um, uh, one particular community, uh, well, maybe two, two particular communities. One of the people who do a sort of grunt work, as you yes. say, anybody counting things. Yes. Um, and it's disintermediating the coders themselves yes. because this is a no code world. Absolutely. So that means a regular person is going to be able to create without needing to hire a coder for 100 grand or more. Right. And so, of course, the coders are having a heart attack. Right. Um, and as you say, the accountants are having a heart attack. Right. But this is the key point, is what people haven't got their head around is that AI is going to make your life so much more efficient that you're going to have time. And I remember John Maynard Keynes wrote this letter to his grandchildren where he was saying, you're going to only have to work like 15 hours a week because yeah. you're going to have leisure time. Now, why hasn't that actually happened? I think it's in part because humans won't accept it. Like, what would you do with the leisure time? Because most people are so busy working and their well, whole they identity. they show us what they do. They watch porn, so, yeah. <laughs> Which is like 80% yeah. of the yeah, internet. Right. Well, and so to my point, actually, if we ask, what would you do with all that free time? And 
if you're not working as an accountant, which, by the way, do you love working as an accountant? No, that that? Not, no, no none of them no, love this. No. So what would you love to do? And they might say, well, you know, I would actually love to, and then fill in the blank, whatever. Right. And they go, but you can't make a living doing that. Right. And you're like, well, why not, right? Well, you maybe can. you can, now and you maybe can. you can now try. And the other thing is, what else would you fill your time with? And I'm like, well, how are your personal relationships going? Yeah. Everyone's like, terrible, no good. Da, da. Well, what if you gave more time to those right, things? Right. If you're like, wait, what? I have to work on myself. And then there's also the working on yourself yeah. piece. So I don't know. I think it's an opportunity for an elevation of humanity. And uh, you're right. Yuval Hariri's point that this can also accelerate war and conflict. True. But AI reflects us. Absolutely. We design it. Absolutely. It's not, so... It, it's our choice how we structure it absolutely and how much we let it run us and that's another thing just to finish i feel like you know people feel like they are controlling this thing by asking chat gpt questions no. or whatever and i'm like the phone in your hand are you <laughs> holding it yeah. or is it holding you yeah right and what is it it's a global and now interplanetary network of communications computers servers algorithms AI, and it is making you do things. So who's working for who here, right? right? right. Yeah. And so can you put the phone down right. and now start to make decisions outside of that electronic context? Yeah. And people are like, what, you mean go outside and make a decision by myself? Yeah. Yeah. What would happen then? Yeah. Would, and then would that be really so terrifying? And it's also like exactly, exactly that point. It's like, you know, you look at that and you say to yourself, like, I sometimes don't want to admit out loud to people that I do work 15 hours a week. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it's because they're like, whoa, whoa. How like, could you do how all could you this? Do that? Like, you know, you're not productive enough. I'm like, no, no, I'm actually fine because I've done those things you just talked about, right? It's like, I focus on like, what would it look like to actually create a new world, a new life where I don't have to work 60 hours a week, but still have a quality of life where I can live anywhere in the world, do, do what's important to me. I'm not a materialistic person, so that makes it easy. I'm an experiential person, so I like to experience things instead. And I like to live in places and see cultures and meet people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But if I was in the gerbil where I had to like save money to get that sports car and get that mansion, et cetera, I would have to work those 60 or 100 hours a week. And, I think it, you're, what you're saying is asking the question of what's important to you? What is your, what is your definition of quality of life? Mm. How, and is quality of life people, things, relationships, stories, ideas? And how do you create in that? And when I'm hiring people on my teams, I was telling uh, some folks here, the first question I ask them after we do some of the basic, like, you know, what are your skill sets areas? What would you do if you didn't have to work? Like, how would you spend your time <laughs> if you didn't have to work? Most of them have, like, no idea. And they've got two young children. And I'm like, so can I answer it for you? You'd spend time and be a really good dad with your kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just so, it's such a profound break in their, in, their, in, their, in their narrative that they can't even imagine the idea of not working. Well, by the way, and you said you might have, if you really wanted the cool sports car, and here we are at Le Mans, right? right? We're right, seeing right. some of the finest classic cars right. ever built right. an extraordinary engineering and imagination and huge advances that have happened because of the engineering in these things right. and um you know this idea that you have to really work much harder to get the car and but what i'm seeing is the new generation of entrepreneurs and some of you here in this room are exemplary of this and you know what they're making a ton of money on business models that are really effective and not having to work the old, you know, no. whatever, 100 hours a week, they have figured out how to have the work-life balance more than my generation right. did with more diversity of their income. So this idea that even if you want to have the whatever, name the car you right. love most, personally, I love the Jaguar D-Type, but you know, <laughs> do I really have to work much harder? No, I have to work much smarter. smarter. And now we can work much smarter because of AI. And right. anyway, we've talked a long time and we could go on with all this. I know we have to bring this to a close because we're actually going to go off and watch this race. Yes. Um, but what an extraordinary moment in history. Seriously. What a great time to be alive. When everyone says this is the worst place to be alive. When they say this is the worst time to be around, are you kidding? This is the best time to be alive. This is incredible. We're at the precipice of these massive changes around us. 
and just enjoy it. And, and amazing <laughs> positive things. Right. And yeah, it's interesting how everybody catastrophizes. And I'm like, we could, we're, everything is actually getting better right. on most fronts. Right. So, high five. Thank you. <laughs> All the best.